I'd like to take a minute to just welcome everybody to Ask a Naturalist. This is an ongoing series that we've been doing since the pandemic struck and we're gonna keep doing it. So you can, if you like this, you can tune into February's one. The thing about Ask a Naturalist is it's never the same because there's always different questions, which is exciting. And um, we're so lucky to have such a great group of experts and Harris Center folks here um, to share their expertise. I'm gonna start off with um, having Miles introduce himself and Miles is also gonna go over some of our Zoom kind of um, tips. So Miles, yes. take Hi everybody, I'm Miles. I'm the office manager at the Harris Center. And yes, I have some Zoom tips and etiquette for everyone tonight. We're gonna to ask that you stay muted. When you're not talking, I'm gonna go ahead and um, have everybody muted, mute all. Yeah. So when you need to talk, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Uh, we're going to be recording tonight's session. So if you don't want to appear in on any internet video, you can turn your video off on the bottom left hand corner. Uh, if you have audio issues, try headphones. And if you have questions, you can use the chat function. There's a chat button at the, at the bottom of the screen. You can type those in for everybody and uh, we'll field those as, as they come. That's great. Thanks, Miles. That was super. And now we're going to introduce um, some other people who work at the Harris Center. Um, some are here as experts and some are just here because they they like this. So maybe we'll start off with Brett. Since in my screen, you're right next to me. Brett, tell us about yourself. Hey, everyone. I'm the science director at the Harris Center. At these events, I tend to answer questions about amphibians and those questions I imagine for the most part are dormant this time of year, just like the critters. So I might be a little um, quieter, but I also um, love reptiles and sometimes answer some flower questions. Maybe there's a coastal ecology question that I might help out with tonight. Um, and that's that. That's great. And um, Karen, um, why don't you introduce yourself? And while you're introducing yourself, can you tell everybody about your upcoming program? Because some people might want to check that out too. Of course, I was going to plug that. Thanks, Susie. I'm Karen Siever. I am a staff ecologist at the Harris Center. I've been working there about one year now, and it's been wonderful. Uh, I love coming to these events because I'm interested in so many different things. Um, I try to be a collector of, of different species. So I often answer questions about plants, uh, but also some invertebrates too. And I'm given a, a, a program about winter on this coming Tuesday evening at 5.30 the 19th. You can find details, uh, I'll post them in the chat. It's called uh, Weathering Winter, Life at Low Temperatures. And it will be kind of a survey of winter survival sort of strategies that all different organisms use uh, from animals to plants to microbes and kind of all around the world from uh, local places and also some, uh, I'll show some Antarctica photos because I did some graduate work down there where I studied soil ecology focusing on worms. So if you wanna hear more about that, you could come on Tuesday. Hope oh, cool. to see you there. Thanks, Karen. That was a great plug. Awesome. Um, and um, we have tonight, we have somebody, who, uh, one of our staff members who is, this is the first time coming. She's not going to be probably answering any natural history questions, but Sarah, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what your job is at the Harris Center, a job that none of us could, could do like you. <laughs> of, we, would, we would sink the ship. Oh. Sarah, you got to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, I'm Sarah Lefebvre. I've been at the Harris Center since 2006 as the finance administrator. Um, I'm the least of, I don't know much uh, like all these other people, but I came on tonight finally. Hopefully I'll enjoy it and learn a lot. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. And today we have Eric um, Masterson. Why don't you tell us about yourself? And we're so excited you're here with your, your wheels back. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Masterson, and I work um, in the Harris Center. I, I manage the land portfolio. So that's 
24,000 acres of easements and land that we own. And uh, in my spare time, I'm a bird nut. So any bird questions, I'm happy to answer. That's awesome. I like how you described yourself as a bird nut. And um, we have another bird nut on, on tonight's call, which is good because we have some bird, we have a lot of bird questions. So um, how about Phil? How about, tell us about yourself. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Phil Brown. I'm the Hawk Watch Coordinator with the Harris Center. Uh, at this point of the year, most of the, uh, the migratory raptors have already passed our area, but there's still quite a few around. So, um, so my work with the Harris Center has slowed down a little bit, but I'm glad to be here and also answer bird questions and maybe some other stuff. Great. Thanks, Phil. I, I, are you a bird nut too, or would you describe yourself as something different? Saying bird nut, yeah, okay. Um, let's get down to, um, how about John? How, what kind of nut would you describe yourself as? Uh, cashew, probably. No, just kidding. Um, so uh, my name is John Benjamin. I um, am a teacher naturalist at the Harris Center and I tend to answer questions here related to fungi and mushrooms. That's because you're a fungi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and how about Margaret? Why don't you tell us about yourself? You always make us look so good. Uh, hey, hi, I'm Margaret Baker. And I um, design um, all of the printed material uh, for the Hair Center, everything that gets mailed, some things that go on the web um, as well. Um, and so I, my, my uh, most favorite, one of my favorite things to do for the Ask the a Naturalist program is to take the slides and, and um, add color and size photos and um, size fonts and just, you know, have fun with that. It's really great. So I love it. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret, for always doing such a beautiful job on the Ask a Naturalist slides. Oh. Yeah. And last but not least, Jeremy, who are you and what kind of nut are you? I'm a tree nut. Uh, I'm Jeremy Wilson. Uh, I've actually, this is my eighth year at the Harris Center, hard to believe. I'm the director there and I try to ask, answer questions about trees. Thank you. And uh, I'm Susie and I'm the community programs director and I'm a mammals nut. Um, especially scat. I love the scat. So um, tonight we have a whole bunch of great questions sent in from, um, from folks maybe in the audience tonight, or maybe um, they are not here, but they sent us some photographs or a question. And what we're going to do is go through them. And if you have any questions or comments while we're answering them, you can put them in the chat and we always try to respond. So um, let's get to it. What's our first question? I always like to read them out loud. So I'll read it and then we'll turn it over. Why would a bird, a titmouse, I think, carry a dry beech leaf in its beak to a tree limb? The bird held onto the leaf with its feet against the branch for a short time, but then lost its grip and the leaf started to float down. The bird looked dismayed. Yes, my anthrop am I anthropomorphizing? And briefly started to follow it, but then came back to the branch before flying away. So I'm wondering, um, bird nuts, Eric and um, Phil, what it, what's going on with this titmouse and the beech leaf? Any theories, any thoughts? Sure, I'll start. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I remember this question. <laughs> this, this came back. And I think a little bit of time spent thinking about what was going on here helped me figure out the mystery. At least I have a theory. Um, tit mice are uh, forage, foragers of insects and seeds mostly. They're a common backyard feeder bird and they're, um, they're loosely associated with mixed flocks like chickadees um, feeding at your bird feeder. So they have a very small bill though and it's not a, a great bill for cracking a lot of seeds at one time or foraging in one place. So they have to do a lot of moving around. Um, so just like they would be taking a seed back from your bird feeder and pecking away at it somewhere on a branch, I'm guessing this bird simply had a meal rolled up there in that leaf. It probably came across some insect uh, and it was going to be pecking that leaf apart to, to get at it. So I'd be dismayed too if I lost my meal. But luckily it can fly and pick it up again. 
That's great. Um, Eric, do you have, want to add any thoughts to that or, or what do you think? I think Phil did a terrific job. So one, one not is enough on this answer. Great. All right. Let's see what our next question is. Ah, uh, is this a black squirrel or a dark gray squirrel or something different from Francie? Wow, I love this question as a mammals person and super exciting because this year for the school year, the Harris Center teaching staff in their elementary school programs has really been focusing on squirrels and we all are kind of nuts about them. Um, and what I have to tell you about this black squirrel is that it's actually the Eastern gray squirrel um, with a different color morph. Um, so it is, um, an Eastern gray squirrel genetically, but it is got a genetic anomaly or difference that makes it have this black color, it's melanistic form. And some things that are interesting about, about black squirrels is there's been a lot of research done on what would be the advantage between being a gray squirrel, colored gray and a black squirrel. And these black squirrels happen to occur more often or they're found in more populations in the Northern latitudes of the United States. So why would would, uh, why would it be advantageous to have fur that's black? And the best um, answer that people have come up with, and they've done studies on this research, is that it helps them keep warm in the colder temperatures of the northern latitudes. If you go to Washington, D.C., um, which right now I, I might not recommend, but if you went there um, and you saw squirrels, um, you'd see a lot of black squirrels there. And that's because um, in the Washington DC, DC in the, at the, um, the National Zoo, they had a long time ago um, brought black squirrels in because they thought they were so rare. And um, somehow some gr other squirrels got mixed in with the gray squirrels, some wild squirrels, and they bred. And now there's a lot of black squirrels throughout Washington DC, all from the point of coming from the National Zoo, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and, and when you find some black squirrels, when the black squirrels mate and two black squirrels mate, they often will give birth to black squirrels. So the more black squirrels you have in a population, the more you'll see them. Now, this is not um, this is kind of like a wild thing to, to think about, but prior to settlement in New England colonies, there were actually more black squirrels than there were gray squirrels, according to the record. And that has to do with the fact that um, they are, um, let's see, how, did I, how do I wanna describe this? Um, they weren't hunted as much as they were when the settlers came. Um, and then the settlers hunted them and the black squirrels would kind of stand out a little bit more against the white of the snow. Um, and so they were hunted more and that pressure reduced their numbers. And they're just slowly beginning to return in this area. And I'm noticing in the chat, people are saying they've seen them in London. Um, and that's that's true in London, that's because they brought black squirrels over to the zoo in London and the same thing happened. And they are located across Canada, um, which is pretty cool. Um, again, the Northern latitudes will have more black squirrels than um, Southern latitudes. Um, no, London, Canada. Oh, well, they're also in the actual England. Um, and Eric, I don't know, have you been, have you seen any black squirrels in the UK? They said there's a kind of a black squirrel. I, I have not. Well, we, we uh, the, the gray squirrels we have in, um, in Ireland are introduced from the US. And when I, when I left, before I left Ireland, they hadn't yet become common. They're now pretty common and um, they're squeezing out our native squirrels. But no, I haven't seen them in, in Ireland. Yeah, um, what's interesting too is that um, when they do the genetic research on this, they think what happened was the fox squirrel actually has this genetic, the melanistic gene in it for, and they also have a, a black or a darker form. And there was, um, they think some interbreeding between fox squirrels and gray squirrels. And that's what introduced the gene into the gray squirrel. Um, kind of genome. And this spread of gray and black squirrels has been happening for a long time since the last ice age 11,000 years ago. And so we're just seeing kind of the squirrels that um, 
have been able to survive and make it here um, and the black squirrels are returning. And you can actually do this really cool project on iNaturalist. Um, they have a squirrel mapper project and you can go and take this sort of test where they show you different pictures of squirrels, gray squirrels and black squirrels. And you kind of mark on the screen where you see the black or the gray squirrel. And what it, they're doing is they're studying whether um, humans can see black squirrels better than gray squirrels or gray squirrels and black squirrels. So they're actually collecting the data on that. So you can check that out. So I hope that was a, uh, a good answer to your question, Francie. So this is actually an Eastern gray squirrel just in its black fur morph. So that's what I've got to say about squirrels. Oh, and we're still on a squirrel roll. I just love this slide. This is from good friends of mine, Max and Connie. They wanna know if do flying squirrels live in colonies? We've had large groups like this on occasion as long ago as 45 years. Um, this is just one frame from a very, very busy 23 second video. There were so many of the little guys zipping about, it was impossible to encounter them. Love your programs. Thanks, Max and Connie. We love having you as part of our programs too. And I love this slide. And yeah, we have two types of flying squirrels here in New Hampshire. We have the Northern flying squirrel and the Southern flying squirrel. The Southern flying squirrel is small. It's tiny. It weighs like a maximum of about three ounces. The um, Northern one is just a little bit bigger. It's about five ounces at the max. And the Southern flying squirrel is the one that this is probably what we're seeing. Um, these squirrels are um, the ones that you find in your homes in the winter time. And what happens is in the winter, these squirrels change their behavior. They're pretty uh, socially intolerant the rest of the year. But in the winter, they become gregarious as um, you might read in the literature, seasonally gregarious. And that's a benefit to them. They all cuddle up and snuggle up in colonies, just as you suggest. Um, and they can be up to 50 flying squirrels in a colony and they might be in your house, in your attic. Um, they really like cavities of trees and um, things like that, but um, they will go into your attic and when they do, they can cause quite a bit of problems and you might hear them up in your attic at night. They are exclusively nocturnal, these rodents. So that's why we never see them during the, the daylight hours. They're, they're just specifically nocturnal and they're really designed for that. If, you, if we could see a close up picture and there's one kind of down at the bottom, they have really, really big, big eyes. Um, and you can see those huge eyes and um, they don't really fly, they're gliders. And some people call them gliders and not flyers, but um, these are colonial in the winter. And then as soon as the season shifts, they kind of separate. And they've done some interesting studies about um, who forms the colony. And a lot of times it's related kin. So flying squirrels that have a relationship to each other through um, family ties will call it, will kind of collect together for the winter. I love it. So um, I hope that answered your question, Max and Connie. I, there's been some debate I see on the chat whether you want to have flying squirrels in your house or not. And uh, I recommend no, you probably don't want them in your house because they can cause quite a problem um, chewing your electrical lines, um, getting into your installation, not to mention their scat in your attic causing a bad odor, um, not that fun. So a good thing to do is after the winter has passed, you might want to check your attic area, the eaves of your house and make sure that they're sealed. Um, and if you leave some standing um, dead trees on your property that have cavities created by woodpeckers, then um, that will be a better choice for them to live in than your home. They'll also live in bat houses, um, if you have bat houses and bird houses up. So those are other good options as well. So I hope I got those questions. Did I miss any questions in the chat, Miles or Brett? There's a question about, I guess, if they're in your home and there's urine, if, whether that is dangerous for you. I don't know if you know the answer Ooh. to that. 
I don't know the answer. I did see that out of the corner of my eye, toxic urine, which is, a, is like something that would of course catch my eye. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm going to have to research toxic urine from flying squirrels and tune back in in February. And I'll have an answer to that. It's right up my alley. Anything to do with scat and urine, I, I have to say I'm interested. Okay. So here's a poll. This is a photograph of a bird. We're gonna give you a chance to answer through a poll. Um, who is this bird? Is it a hairy woodpecker, a pileated woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker, woody woodpecker, not a woodpecker? So take a few moments and let's see what we've got for our answer to this poll. We're trying to keep you awake. We do have a test in a few minutes too. Don't worry, you didn't have to study for this test. Give it a few more minutes with other people voting. I feel like there should be like music playing during the voting, but we're just about all right. Let's see. So um, looks as though red belly woodpecker won at 68% followed by a 20% pileated woodpecker. So Eric, why don't you tell us who is this bird? So the um, folks who guessed right, were right. It's a female red bellied woodpecker and you can, you can tell it's a female because it doesn't have the red that extends all the way to the bill. Um, there's, a, there's a paler patch on the crown. And they're pretty cool birds because if you go back, um, we, we just had a Christmas bird count in Peterborough about a month ago, and we counted 39 of these on the Peterborough Hancock Christmas bird count. If you go back to 1988, I think it was, was the first year that they were recorded, and they didn't break double figures into double figures until, um, until well into, I think it was 2010, 2011. So they've really increased in the state in a big way. And they've come up from, from the south. They're very, very common down in Florida and southern states. And so they've, they've expanded northwards. And um, they're really, especially in river valleys um, along the Merrimack and the, the um, Connecticut River Valley up by the seacoast, they're extremely common. But they're even occurring all the way up to the north country now. That's great. Um, Eric, what, why the expansion? Any, any forces you want to talk about or Phil, you want to chime in? Well, bird, uh, Phil should chime in, but I would say bird feeding for sure helps them. And um, there may be macro situations with the forest. You know, we've had a, a lot of pathogens coming through the forest in the last, you know, in, in recent years, most recently with the, um, with the, with the um, emerald ash borer. And so when you get, when you get cavity trees, um, it obviously provides food and nesting opportunities for birds like this. And climate change may have something to do with it too. I mean, for a bird that's, for a Southern bird where you, where, where you get a, a warming climate, um, one would expect that there'd be effects there. But Phil, ju jump in. Sure, yeah, you covered a lot of it. Um, I was going to say something about emerald ash borer, which you mentioned already. So um, it seems like in New England though, they've expanded in advance of emerald ash borer hitting our region. So there is some evidence that maybe they do um, swell in population in areas of ash borer and maybe push out. So we could have been seeing an early wave of them and now they're, they're very much here to stay. But I'd love to take the opportunity to show two side-by-side -side photos here on my screen. Um, a lot of people call this the bird that, that's pictured a red-headed woodpecker. If you've ever seen a real red-headed woodpecker, You'll never mistake it again. So, um, a good one to to learn. Red-headed woodpecker with a full red head is uh, occurring in Keene right now. So, it's a rare bird from the south. Uh, so, maybe the next uh, New England uh, woodpecker to invade our area. Who knows? Wow, that was so cool. I hope my dogs weren't barking. I hope I was muted when they were barking. Was I? No, maybe not. Okay, I wasn't. I apologize. Sorry. Um, all right. So exciting. Um, welcome the red-bellied woodpecker and let's see what our next question is. Okay. Oh, this one is a question for Jeremy. Is black oak the oak tree that has a smell 
I guess a stinky smell from Francie. Jeremy, what do you, can you tell us about black oaks and their odor and where we might find these stinky trees? I, it's interesting. I, I don't think of black oak as being any more smelly than red oak. Red oak and black oak are very similar species that both grow in this region. We see much, much more red oak than we do black oak, but you can find both of them. Um, and both of them do have a very distinctive odor when you first cut the tree. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it just sort of strikes everyone. But there are people who love this smell and there are people who hate this smell. So it's not a universally uh, considered a stink to it. I was thinking about, well, what, what, what makes a, a, a tree smelly? And it's, you know, it's volatile organic compounds that are, that are within the wood that are coming out when you cut it. But there can also be situations where there's fungus or bacteria that's in the tree, um, especially if there's sort of anaerobic conditions in there. You can get very smelly uh, situations when the tree is partially rotted inside and you open it. And that can happen in, a, in any kind of tree. I was also trying to think of other, other trees that smelled. Some people hate the smell of uh, white spruce when it's cut. So red spruce is that beautiful spruce smell. White spruce has a kind of very uriny uh, smell to it when you first cut it. Grand fir, which grows in the Pacific Northwest, is even much worse than that. It's a, it's a, it's a stronger urine smell to it. Um, I don't know. Let's, let's ask if, if other people have tree smells that they hate or like. I, red, red oak is one of those that some people just can't stand it and some people really love it. So I think we, we shouldn't call it a stink. We should call it a it just has an odor and God. it's appreciated or not appreciated. Miles, you got to make a poll. We need a stink <laughs> poll. Can you, can you make a poll as we, uh, for the next, can you work out a poll while we go on to the next <laughs> slide? Stinky, hmm. you know, what? what is your, I don't know, maybe it's a fill in, maybe it's a multiple choice. Maybe people just want to put in the chat whether they like the smell of oak or not. Well, to, in answer to Francie's question, Oak, the red oak and black oak have, have very distinctive odors, but not everybody hates it, so. Uh, Jeremy, would you take it, could you try to describe it if somebody hasn't smelled it? Like what, what words would you use? What's is the like bouquet? Wine, is this like wine tasting? Yeah, yeah, it's like wine tasting. What's the bouquet <laughs> of, the stink, of, the, of the black oak that might or might not be stinky? A, a little funky, but you know, perfumey, funky in a sense. Oh, sounds good. This coming from a person who will sniff fox urine at a, at a glance. I'm sure it, it probably smells better than fox urine, but I'll smell fox urine. I'll smell black oak. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. That was great. Let's see what our next slide is today. Last month, you gave a wonderful description of the albino porcupine. Now he returned to the yard and all his back quills are gone. What happened to them? Thank you from Linda and Jaffrey. Wow, Linda, this was like, this is really interesting. So as you can see on this picture, um, this albino porcupine, which has been showing up in Linda's yard, um, has this very bare spot on the back of its body. And um, when you see that on a porcupine, that means that it got into tangled, it got tangled up with a predator probably an inexperienced predator. So animals that are experienced at eating a porcupine, there's not that many of them, but Fisher would be one of them. They don't go for the back of the porcupine. That's fully quilled. They go for the face of the porcupine, which has got fur and not quills. Or they um, chase them up a tree and snap and snap at them and the porcupine falls off out of the tree and then they can get to the porcupine's belly, which also has no quills. So when you see something like this, this is a sign that this porcupine tangled up with a predator, it survived, and the predator is probably walking around with a bunch of quills in its face. Um, what's really interesting about this is the spot, that back spot of the porcupine that you see in the tail that is also um, has that bareness to it. That's the distinctive um, kind of behavior of, of, of porcupines when they're being attacked is they'll turn their back to you and flash their tail back and forth. And that's what kind of gave them the myth of 
shooting their quills. They don't shoot their quills. You actually have to come into contact with the quill and touch them and there's a little barb at the end and then it will pull out just like a hair follicle. It's just a specialized hair. So this porcupine was probably had its back up to a predator and the predator kind of struck at it and um, it lost quite a few of its quills on its back and its tail. And the section where it lost its quills is an important section of the porcupine. That's the rosette of the porcupine. The lower back near the base of the tail is a scent gland called the rosette. And it's very, very odory. Um, and I will describe it as not a pleasant odor. I've handled some porcupine, um, well, a lot of porcupine. And when they get nervous, they'll produce this odor that comes from the rosette. And it's very musky. If you were another porcupine, you'd probably like the smell of it. But for us, it just smells oily, musky, very animally. Um, and it's not, it's it's a little skunky, but not you wouldn't describe it as skunky. It just smells off, bad, uh, bad animal odor. It smells like red oak, Susie. It smells like red oak, maybe. Um, you might be wondering how long it will take for this porcupine to grow back its quills. I know that that's a question. I When I saw this picture, I was like, I got to know, how long is it going to take? And it actually takes them quite a while to grow back their quills, just like it might take us quite a while to grow back our hair. Um, it three and a half to five months for it to grow back the quills to its full covering. And that um, length of time, time might even be influenced by the diet in the winter. So in the winter, the porcupine's diet is really based on hemlock and it's not very varied and it's hard to make a living in the winter. It's hard to have, all of your energy is going to supporting your life, not to regrowing your quills. But um, so it might take it longer, but eventually this porcupine will grow back its quills. What's also kind of cool about the porcupine is when they're anxious and they their quills become erect, their quills just don't go in one direction. They don't all go up and um, they kind of go crisscross and all over the place. So when this porcupine is in a, a position where it has to defend itself, the rest of the quills are gonna stand up around and it's gonna be kind of crisscrossed and, and that's gonna help protect that area. And even when the porcupine quills are regrowing, even though it might take that length of time to regrow, they're still pretty formidable um, and can be used for protection. So Linda, I don't know what got into your porcupine, um, but something did and maybe it was a dog. Um, or an inexperienced predator. Uh, just over, Chris, over Thanksgiving, I had a skunk in my backyard and it was out during the day. It was acting really odd. Everybody in my town, lots of people saw it in Hancock. It had uh, been quilled in the face, which is a very unusual thing for a skunk to be quilled. And um, even though I tried to capture it and wanted to give it to uh, Maria Colby, a wildlife rehabilitator, um, I never was successful at capturing it. And I don't think the skunk survived. It had quills around its eyes. So that's the answer to my skunk question. Is there any, did I miss any chats, any questions? Could it be more prone to frostbite? Yeah, um, good question. Um, you know, uh, I would say that that could be a possibility. Um, they could get frostbit on that section, especially those white quills are not gonna help keep it warm the way the darker tipped quills of a normally colored porcupine would. So uh, Linda, you'll have to keep us updated. Hopefully you'll keep seeing this porcupine. And when you do, um, it will, you can let us know how its quill regrowth is going. All right, let's move on to the next question. Turn the tables, here we go, people. We are turning the tables on you. We have a question for you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put a word up the first person to correctly define the word in the chat will receive a Harris Center hat. And Brett, I'm gonna put you in charge of the appropriate definition because you are really good at that. Um, so get ready, here comes the word. Define the word crepuscular. Okay, so if you can send your definition of the word crepuscular into the chat, um, the first person to receive it, and Brett, you'll let us know who that is. 
Then we Kim, have- Kim did not delay. Kim Laws answered it right away and answered it correctly. Um, yes, and there's a several other answers that are other ways of saying the same thing. Good For job. Pasta, here's one of my favorite words. And it, Brett, can you, yeah. yeah, can you tell us what did Kim define it as? So Kim said active at dawn and dusk, which is a perfect way of describing it, twilight times or dawn and dusk. So it's kind of the in-between um, companion word to nocturnal, active at night, or diurnal, active at day. Crepuscular is active at the twilight times in between night and day. And there are a lot of wildlife species that are particularly active at that time. So it's a great word to impress all your friends with your wildlife vocabulary. Great job and great job, Kim. We have a hat for you. If you can um, give um, Miles your mailing address um, in a private chat to him, we will send you a Harris Center hat for answering that word correctly um, and, and getting the turn the tables right. Good job. Oh, good question. What animals are crepuscular? Um, Let's see, does anybody want to add any of our experts out there want to share any crepuscular animals that come to mind? Woodcock, Eric said, in the summertime, nighthawks are crepuscular. Um, Woodcock's a great one. Would you describe Susie beavers as crepuscular? Uh, yeah, beavers have that as a definition as being crepuscular. And I see Tony saying rabbits. It's another animal that is often described as crepuscular. And if you want to know more about rabbits, let me just tell you, next Thursday night, same time, same place, you can join Dr. Adrienne Kovach. She is doing the New England Cottontail Reintroduction Project for the state of New Hampshire, professor at UNH. And she's gonna be talking about New England Cottontail rabbits, their behavior, the ecology, um, what their studies are finding and how the reintroduction project is going. Really cool. So good work on crepuscular and great. I see a lot of people piping in. All right, wow, we have some a stunning scat. This just makes my day when I see this. Um, I love this photograph and I'm going to turn it over though to Phil Brown. Um, Phil, yeah. tell us yeah. about this scat. Yeah, this was exciting to see. Um, it's always fun to, to find bird scat that you can recognize that's not wild turkey scat, which is the, the most common that we come across generally. But um, this is a giveaway in, in some ways. If you're, if you're, um, you know, if you watch birds in the woods a lot and you follow them around and you know, see a big pile of chips under a tree, and you can tell that that is bird scat, um, you have a pretty good clue as to what this one is because it's large too. Um, these individual scats are about an inch, inch and a half long. Those casings are white all around them. Uh, the white part of the scat is the uh, the uric acid, and um, it, unlike humans, we, we have liquids to uh, excrete our, our waste. Birds have to concentrate it, so birds have this uric acid coating on their scat. So the actual food inside that white casing is what they're eating. Um, so side by side, there are two of the same, and I'm curious if anybody has a guess here, if they wanted to type it in into the, uh, into the chat first person to identify it correctly. Um, but this, this is the same species that has two very different looking scats in these images. Um, so I was, I was excited to see one because one is not very common. Yes, the uh, Carl and, and many others here are chiming in with pileated woodpecker. And indeed, that's what it is. So um, yeah, pileated woodpeckers are mostly feeding on ants, carpenter ants in, uh, in dead and dying trees. They're not killing the trees. They are, uh, they're more of a symptom of the, the ants that are excavating through the tree. So I found this one under a, a young dead pine tree and um, they were large rectangular or oval shaped cavities. And pileated woodpeckers eat, uh, eat ants almost exclusively sometimes of the year. Um, well over 50% of their diet is ants. Uh, and that's unlike a lot of other birds, but the flickers and the pileateds in particular are the two that probably specialize on ants more than any other bird in the U.S. So um, they can deal with the uh, with the formic acid that the ants have. 
but the, the scat on the bottom obviously is not antibodies. The one above is all those little black pieces. That's all antibodies. So the one below is loaded with color and with seeds. Any guesses there? One guess came in. Uh, it's not crab apple. From what I was able to tell, I did ID it at least down to the, uh, the genus. Um, pin cherry sumac. Yes, Kim guessed it correctly. Uh, most likely the staghorn sumac, which is the most common sumac in our area. It's a small tree. They get to about 15 feet in size. And they have these, these nice red colored um, uh, tufts of, of fruit, essentially called a droop. And, um, and the pileateds are going after those as a kind of a low quality, but, but still important supplemental food source. So they can, they can get some fat from, from the uh, fruit. Um, so the scats and, and the, uh, the flesh itself, which is the red stuff. Um, so yeah, it's not every day I've, I've come across the sumac actually in the scat, but, but if you watch carefully, you may see affiliated on sumac stalks feeding on them. So Phil, a good question, so good guessing, everybody. a question that mm -hmm. came in is, um, the, the seedy parts, that's the seed of the sumac. The, yes. the round, so those are the, the the round seeds of the sumac that it's eating. Correct. Cool. Yeah, well, um, it's, it's just gorging the seed. So it's it's actually effectively a very important uh, seed disperser here in this way. Yeah, that's really cool. I love finding pileated um, woodpecker scat too. And and something about it that um, I always, when I'm with kids, we look at it, it's, it's glittery. It kind of shines because the exoskeletons of the ant body um, have that kind of um, chitin. It's, it's um, you know, like bug, bug parts. So you could really see it looks glittery and the kids really like that. And it's pretty common for some birds to have two types of scat too. Like um, I'm thinking about grouse at this time of the year when you can find um, kind of what looks like, uh, like a diarrhea, like a poof. And then the one that, and then their other type of scat is um, more like an ash. It looks like an ash from a cigarette that they make after they wake in the morning. So Phil or Eric, do you want to comment on anything about that? Go ahead. Cool. Yeah, and, uh, what, what, it's fantastic observation though, Phil. Thank you for bringing that in. Yeah, that was great. And here's a poll. Could you possibly identify this raptor who was in my backyard in Nashua? So take a good look at this raptor and here are the choices. Red-tailed hawk, Cooper's hawk, sharp-shinned hawk, bald eagle, I give up. Raptors are hard. We give a few minutes for people to vote. And if you can't see the poll and you have your chat open, you'll want to close down your chat so you can see the poll. And you can move the poll too so you can see the photograph a little more. Give everybody a few more moments. Ooh. Lots of thinking going on. Wow, we have a neck and neck. It's very close. Looks to me like we have Cooper's Hawk as, as the front runner, but it's close if, if we were Recounting votes, we might have to go back and recount votes, but we won't. Uh, sharp shinned hawk, close second, and red tail hawk as the as a, a runner up. And then some people gave up because it was just hard. So uh, Phil and Eric, break it down for us. Who is this? So yeah, this is a, the by a by a hair's breadth. The we the winner uh, is correct. It's a Cooper's hawk, and this is the most. I I believe this is the most frequently misidentified bird in eBird, which eBird gets, you know, millions of observations a year. And this certainly in North America is one of the most frequently misidentified birds at all plumages because they are really, they are really tough to tell from sharp chin talks. And a lot of it is, is um, qualitative, you know, you look at, you look at some birds and it's very distinct. They have a white rump or a yellow wing bar and something that's very, very useful and, and categorical. But with these guys, 
less so it's qualitative. And so for, for a, a Cooper's hawk, it's a larger bird, but that's relative, you can't really tell that. Um, for young, young Cooper's hawks, they have these very um, well-defined um, teardrop streaks on the underparts. They're coarser um, streaks on the other parts of a sharp shinned hawk. Coopers are also, um, they're larger, but they also have a longer tail um, and a longer neck. And that, that's especially useful in flight. Um, if you could see the end of the tail of this bird, um, the retresses, which is the name for a bird's tail feathers, they're not of equal length and the outer retresses are shorter. And what that essentially means is that Cooper's hawk have a rounded tail, sharp shinned hawk have a squared off tail. And you can see that in flight, but you can also see it um, when the birds are, um, are, are perched. You can't see it in this one. Um, Cooper's hawks have slightly thicker legs also, which again, it's relative and it's qualitative, but um, if you were to see a sharp shinned hawk, its legs are pencil thin. And sharp sharp shinned are less fierce looking. They have a rounder head and they're, they're a gentler, they have a gentler appearance. But it's a really tough ID. And if you, you know, I mean, God knows how many of these I've misidentified in my lifetime. They're a very tough ID. So don't be hard on yourself. Thanks, Eric. I, I like that new word you introduced. Um, it might have to show up in our turn the tables for next, next month. Retresses, is that the word? Yeah, right? or E-T or I-C-E. -E. Oh, cool. That's really cool. And that's the end of the tail. That's the tail feather, the whether tail it's feathers. a cardinal or a hawk or any bird. That's the cool. feather that grows on the tail. That's great. Well, thank you. And thanks, Liz, for sending in this photograph. What a what a wonderful sighting. Uh, wondering if you have bird feeders and if it was scouting your bird feeder. Because, Eric, am I right in thinking that's a behavior a Cooper, Cooper's hawk would engage in? Yeah, they're specialized in taking birds on the wing. So, so they're very, very adept. The long tail, the short, relatively short wings and relatively long tail makes them extremely agile. And so they're a perfect ha hawk for, um, for darting through, through narrow spaces in forests. And so if they come to your feeder, they're gonna be a, more than a match for, for a bird, especially if it's, if it's a, a feeder that's isolated from nearby trees, if it's gotta go over any sort of opening to get to safety, a Cooper's hawk will, will have, have the advantage. And a, and a sharp shin too, both of them are, are feeder, feeder pre predators of birds at feeders. Cooper's might be, I, Phil may have a comment on this because he keeps an eye on the, on the numbers more than I do, but Cooper's are, especially in the wind, I mean, neither of them is particularly common in the winter. Cooper's I always think of as being slightly more common than sharp shin hawks. And they're a recent, not a recent arrival, but they've become much more common in recent years in New Hampshire than, than they were 20, 30 years ago. Wow, cool. Um, Phil, do you wanna add anything? I noticed in the chat, you said that um, their legs are good for running. So will they pursue prey on the ground? Yep, yeah, like things like backyard chickens, they can, they can uh, be th threatening backyard chickens and other birds uh, that they might hit on the wing and then have to run around for and, and catch in the forest floor. So that's some of the, the use of those long legs. Um, wow. But yeah, population-wise, they're both in our area in the winter. Uh, Coopers may be a little bit more common at this point. And there seems to be maybe more of a stronger preference for urban and open areas for Coopers hawks in winter compared to sharp shinned hawks, which are more typically in the denser woodlands and the maybe higher elevations in New Hampshire. That's great, thank you. All right, let's move on and see what we've got for the next one. Oh, so pretty, such a sight to see in the middle of winter. I found these shells on one beach in Chappaquiddick. Why do they have such colored and pattern differentiation in the same waters? Such beautiful colors, Lida. So Brett, I'm turning to you because I know how much you love spending time at the ocean. And I know that, that um, you've done coastal ecology courses that you've taught. Can you shed some light on Lida's question? So Lida's specific question, I'm gonna turn over to Karen Siever because she um, is really great with um, some details that I, that I did not know, she taught me about this this week. But I can tell you a few things just about these shells before I turn it over to Karen to talk about the color pa and pattern in them. Um, these are all um, Atlantic Bay scallop shells. We really only have two scallop species here in New England um, 
the sea scallops, which are the ones that you probably more com most commonly eat, which are really a, a deep water species, and they, they're much larger in size, and their shells have um, the ridges are, are much finer. Um, they look, they have a very different appearance. And then these base scallops, which have these well-defined ridges um, and a variety of colors, as you can see, they're um, closer to shore. And one thing that happens, that, so Chappaquiddick is just off of Martha's Vineyard near the Cape and on both Cape, Cape Cod and the islands, um, every fall, it's very common for juvenile scallop shells to wash ashore after a storm for the, sh the, sh the scallops themselves while they're still alive. Um, these are all just shells, you can tell, because they're, they're half of a scallop and scallops are bivalves, so they have two shells, shells that come together when they're living. Um, but they, they live, um, especially as juveniles in eelgrass beds and, and their connection to the, the threads that connect them to those beds um, is no match for a big winter storm or a fall storm. And so it's very common in the fall and winter to see lots of live bay scallops washed ashore. You can tell that they're when they're alive because they've got both shells and they will actually um, snap at you. They will, um, they, because their way, they can actually, scallops can actually swim. Most people think of bivalves as fairly sedentary, but scallops can swim and it's a way of escaping predators is that they open their shells and clamp them shut quickly to propel water out of them to kind of give them a little jet boost to get away. And so when they're alive, if you pick one up in your hand, it will, it will snap at you like that to try to escape, except there's no water. So it's not moving itself the way it would if it were um, in the water. And um, the other cool thing about them is that they have many blue eyes. You probably you may have heard the, the blue-eyed scallop. Um, when, they, when they open themselves to snap, if you look inside, you see lots of blue little neon blue dots and that's their um, mechanisms for seeing. They don't see very well, but they can see um, dark and light and movement and that sort of thing. So I, that's all I can tell you about these shells is that they're scallop shells, but um, Karen knows a little bit more about the kind of, um, how and why they might look different in color, even though they're the same species. So take it away, Karen. Oh, the great points mentioned. Um, the swimming activity behavior is a really neat one. Um, well, one little just sort of a morphological thing I would mention, well, a couple things is uh, how you can tell these are scallop shells is they have a little triangles that are at the base, like on the hinge side. Um, and a, a fun word for those is they're called oracles with an A. Um, I'll put the word in the chat. It's a neat word, oracles. And that's how you can tell scallops from like a cockle shell, other similar bivalves. Um, so, you know, these are in, these are mollusks, right? So um, they're primitive in some ways and advanced in others. They have a crazy network of, of a couple dozen brains that help to control some of those eyes that Brett was mentioning. Uh, but like Brett mentioned, these are probably all the same species, or at least all in the same genus for sure, the Argopectins. And um, their color is is partially controlled by genes and partially controlled by the environment. So um, when they're alive, so and when they become deceased and the, the shells separate, if the shells get buried in the sand, uh, they start to decompose. They, there's actually a lot of uh, valuable materials that the mollusks have filtered out of the water through their life and sort of uh, uh, packed within their shelves. So the heterotrophic decomposers will go after them. If they're buried in the sand, they start to oxidize because of anaerobic activity. And that's when you can see the really dark grays and blacks develop on some of these shells. Those would be sort of older shells that have been buried in this way, typically. So if you're ever beachcombing and you see some shells wash up, wash up that are really, really dark in color, those are typically shells that have uh, been buried for some time and, and are more uh, decomposed. Uh, so the ones that are closer to what the living scallops would look like are the ones that are, of course, that lovely ruby orangish one in the middle. 
and then more of your tans. When they're alive, they have this sort of almost cilia-like material on the outside, um, this hy hydrophobic layer that ho helps to collect algae and things like that. So they look very different when they're alive as, as opposed to when you find them like this, when they're no longer that way, but still beautiful nonetheless. Wow, thank you. That was fascinating. I love this question that was sort of out of the forest and woods of our usual area and brought us to the coastline of New Hampshire, or, or in this case, Massachusetts. Thanks so much for giving that question. And Karen and Brett, thank you. All right, we are going to have to go to this poll. Here's a photograph. This is our last poll for this evening and our last slide. Mistletoe, we think the host is blueberry. What is the explanation for this amazing growth? Multiple choice, you can pick more than one. Mistletoe, bird's nest, swamp monster, witch's broom, fungal infection. So take a look at that picture. Like Susie said, you can choose more than one. You can choose more than one in this case. It's it's multiple choice. So I'm shocked that nobody's choosing Swamp Monster. Oh, yay! Wow. Give people just a few more seconds to respond. Okay, it looks as though we've got um, Witch's Broom as the first answer, fungal infection as the second, then bird's nest, then mistletoe, and then swamp monster. So for this one, let's let's turn it over to John. John, can you give, shed some light on this strange growth that we have here showing on this plant? Uh, yeah, so it is commonly known as witch's broom. That's the uh, nickname that a lot of people might recognize. And it is also a fungal pathogen evidence in blueberries, usually high bush blueberries, but other members of the vaccin family. So sometimes the low bush blueberries too. And this, uh, it's a fungus, it's a rust fungus. It has the super memorable scientific name of Puciniastrum gopertianum. And uh, it's a pretty interesting pathogenic fungus because it actually has two hosts. It cycles between blueberries and fir trees. So um, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, so uh, basically, it, you know, it, part of its life, it's in the needles of fir trees. So in New England, that's going to be balsam fir trees largely. And then the needles will grow these little fruiting bodies that release the spores in the spring. And then that will disperse through the wind to blueberry bushes. And then it will be, you know, get into the uh, blueberry plant through the bark and become systemic in the blueberry. So it just infects all throughout the inside of it. And then you will get these strange growths of all those condensed little shoots that we uh, call the witch's broom part. And um, this is obviously uh, a big problem for people that grow blueberry commercially. So there's a lot of things written about, you know, how you deal with it. And once a blueberry gets infected with it, you can't get rid of it. You can't cure it. But apparently you can manage it so that the blueberry bush can continue to produce fruit for a number of years. But uh, as, as the fungus goes unchecked, it will compromise the ability of the blueberry to produce fruit over time. And then basically the, uh, you know, the little shoots in the, the witch's broom growth will then release spores that will go back into fir needles. So it's kind of this back and forth cycle between the two hosts. Uh, so one of, one of the recommendations, if you really want to prevent this from happening to your blueberries, is you want to make sure there are no balsam fir trees nearby within a quarter of a mile. They even recommend if you can manage that. Wow, John, that was really fascinating. I loved it. I've always seen Witch's Broom and kind of had an understanding of what it was, but I think you explained that really well. Can you, um, what's mistletoe? That's something different. Karen's nodding her head. Karen, do, can you tell us what mistletoe is? Yeah, um, I, don't, I couldn't tell you the, you know, scientific name. I'd have to look that up. But what I know about mistletoe is it's a plant on plant parasite. So it is an, an epiphyte. So it will be found in the canopy of trees. Uh, maybe Jeremy, I know there's species associations. I don't know if Jeremy could chime in there, but um, it's often spread, it, the mistletoe forms berries and it's often spread from tree to tree by birds consuming the berries. And then the mistletoe uh, germinates in the canopy of a tree and then actually uh, intercalates 
its root system, aerial root system into the tree itself and steals some of the, the sugar. It, it photosynthesizes itself, but it steals quite a bit from the xylem of the host tree. Wow. So it's pretty interesting. I always find that interesting for the thing that we uh, smooch our, our loved ones under at the holidays is uh, a, a parasitic plant. Oh my God, <laughs> this is a dark side. I, I feel a nature on tap coming up with that. Jeremy, do you want to add anything on to mistletoe since you're our nuts about trees? Uh, only that there's a lot of species of mistletoe and they infect different species of trees. So Karen, am I right that the mistletoe that people kiss under is live oak based? I think so. I think because especially because of the, you know, European connection there. Um, but yes, it's something, um, sometimes you see mistletoe for sale. So it's a good thing, kind of like Oriental bittersweet to maybe think about buying um, an artificial version rather than the actual version because it would be a shame. Uh, the mistletoe berries are white. It's attractive, uh, but something, go to the thrift store. They have a lot of plastic mistletoe from the 70s. That's great. Good suggestion, Karen. On that note, ending with the smooching, um, I want to tell everybody that our next Ask a Naturalist, our next Ask a Naturalist is on February 18th, 530 to 630. And since February, it's close to Valentine's Day, we might perhaps want to focus our Ask a Naturalist questions on love and romance in the wild. So if you have any burning questions about how animals do it, how birds and bees do it, how mistletoe does it. I don't know. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to know, but if you do, you can send those questions to us. We won't be afraid to tackle them on Ask a Naturalist February edition, the edition of love. So I want to thank everybody tonight for coming out. Um, it was a wonderful night and congratulations to Kim for winning the Harris Center hat um, next month. We'll have another turn the tables, maybe two turn the tables. And thank you to our panelists for answering questions and coming out on a Thursday night. And thank you guys for being here and um, supporting the Harris Center by coming to this program. And hopefully we'll see you at some of our more other programs that we have. So yay, thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>